Hello and welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm your host, Richard Reinch. Liberty Law Talk is featured at the online journal Law and Liberty, which is available at lawliberty.org. Hello, I'm Richard Reinch. Today we're talking with Stephen Smith about his new book, Fictions, Lies, and the Authority of Law. Stephen Smith is the Warren Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of San Diego. He's the author of numerous books, uh, including The Rise and Decline of American Religious Freedom, Law's Quandary, and he's been on this podcast. I know, I think this is your third appearance, Stephen, so we're glad that you're uh, I think it might be. Mm-hmm. A, a repeat offender. It was uh, Pagans and Christians in the City, I think was the most recent appearance. I think we did do uh, have a conversation about that one, yes. It's great to have you back, and you've written another provocative book here, Fictions, Lies, and the Authority of Law. So tell us what's going on. Well, you know, the book combines some things I wanted to write about, various subjects that are all connected, I think, by the problem of authority, questions of authority. And I tried to uh, have a sort of a lead into that uh, by quoting Hannah Arendt's, I think, I think very intriguing claim that she made about the middle of the last century, that authority has disappeared from the modern world. We no longer know what it is. And in losing authority, she said, we have lost the groundwork of the world. <laughs> so that's yeah. pretty provocative. Yes. But also puzzling and, you know, raises lots of questions. So I kind of use that as the way to get into some of these uh, various questions. Some of them are more sort of standard law professor type questions about constitutional interpretation and statutory interpretation and so forth. Uh, some of them are more straight jurisprudence questions, you know, that legal philosophers like H.L.A. Hart and so forth have, have dealt with. And some of them have to do with things that I think are really on the minds of and kind of worrisome to a lot of people today about cancel culture, living with lies, uh, that that sort of stuff is also the subject of one of one of the chapters. Yeah, I'll confess this. So coming to your book before I started reading it, what got me interested in it and, and thinking that this could be an interesting interview is just looking at contemporary America right now and we've got this heavy movement, we've covered it extensively at Law and Liberty, that insists basically America is founded on a fraud. And it goes beyond even the old progressive claim that we're ill-founded, uh, but that we're, we're just founded on something like slavery and racism and yeah. sort of the perpetuation of that through our institutions. And then, of course, the way in which political claims are debated, or rather not debated in many respects in our, in our country, and how we you know, label one another as not just wrong, but people we struggle to even dialogue with. Uh, just thinking about right now, uh, this question about, you know, masks reemerging with the Delta variant in certain states mm-hmm. and are masks going to be required and how we deal with people who don't want to wear masks and vice versa. And I, all of this, I mean, the general tenor of our politics makes me think there is nothing in our constitutional order that we see as transcending heated contemporary differences. Do you see it that way? And is that sort of related to what you're doing in the book? Yes and no. I I think actually it's turned out with all of the anti-racism concerns and the COVID restrictions and so forth, that there are a lot of ways that the book has sort of like immediate applications more than I thought it would have as I was doing it, or even when I was pretty much finished with it, which was, you know, uh, I finished writing it really almost a couple of years ago uh, b- before a lot of this happened. And, you know, it takes a while to get something published. But yeah. um, and in the meantime, <laughs> it's been gratifying and alarming to see that I think there are quite a lot of applications to some of our, you know, uh, sort of on the ground, current practical concerns. But I mean, one way, to, one way to get into that, I suppose, would be to say that our system of government is based on the idea that government has to be, has to come from the consent of the governed. That's kind of like a foundational proposition. Yeah. It's in the Declaration of Independence. You know, it's been recited, you know, innumerable times over the course of our history. That's kind of axiomatic in many ways. It's also perfectly familiar, I think, and lots of people have written about this, that that's a problematic idea. Do we really have the consent? of the government. So I sort of deal with that in what I think is a little different way, saying, well, in a certain sense, no, it's a fiction to say that we have the consent of the government. But we can have accounts of authority, I think, that can be based on fictions if the fictions are widely believed. I try to combine the sort of consent of the governed 
idea with the idea that people like John Finnis, but other people have developed a, a sort of a coordination account of authority. You know, that authority comes from the need for coordination, not just punishing offenders and so forth, and antisocial, you know, criminals and so forth, but coordination that will allow us to coordinate for the public good a lot of our, you know, projects that we have. And uh, so that we have a need for that and the ability, as Finnis and others say, of some group or institution to provide that coordination is sort of the foundation of authority. I find that to be quite, uh, quite a plausible account. But it creates a question, you know, where do people get or where does some person or institution get that ability to provide coordination? And the answer, I think, is at least in part, they get it because we think they have authority. And we, in our system, we think they have authority goes back to the consent of the governed. And so the consent of the governed does sort of figure in authority, even if it is to some extent a fiction, I think. Yeah. Um, if it's a fiction that's widely believed and beneficial, I think it can be the basis of, of actual yeah. authority. But if the fiction becomes frayed and so forth, you know, there's discussion, then the authority can disappear. And I think we're seeing real concerns about that, you know, just over the last couple of years. What do you think Hannah Arendt meant by you know, the modern world faces the evacuation of authority. What, do you, what did she mean by that? She, she has a long answer on that that traces this back to, you know, Roman ideas and, and so forth. And to be honest, I don't really go into that much because yeah. she's not the only person who has claimed that. I, I, I quote several other people who have also said, Soren Kierkegaard, for example, you know, another more recent uh, observers who say that authority has disappeared from the modern world or that it's very problematic or that we don't understand what it is. And so I say sort of up front that this isn't going to be an exegetical sort of work trying to figure out what any person in particular mm-hmm. had in mind. But I admit I sort of use it more as a point of departure to yeah. you know explore. I, I keep coming back to her and claim, but I'm still using it sort of less to figure out what exactly she meant yeah. And more as a point of departure to consider a lot of things that I mentioned. Yeah. I've read, you know, I haven't read or read a lot, uh, but, uh, you know, that groundwork of the world. Um, mm-hmm. I, I mean, it's, do you think she, I mean, is this some sort of classical? I doubt she meant what I end up. Cla- <laughs> classical political philosophy account of reason and politics. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. That's question on on consent of the governed, though, my understanding, like the root of that concept from Harold Berman's uh, Law and Revolution is monastical reform in the early medieval period. And the principle oh, uh-huh. being uh, within monasteries voting amongst the monks uh-huh. on you know, who would be your abbot, uh, what would be the rules that would govern. And the, the idea being what touches all concerns all and therefore should receive consent by all. And I, I, in my understanding, that's sort of the, it's like a natural law root of that, taking, you know, man as a dignified being created by God seriously and his reason seriously, therefore his consent as to what touches him mm-hmm. in law. And I, I've always thought that's not, not someone trying to articulate a fictional account, but of maybe a truthful account of, of who man is and, you know, how he should be governed. And then that sort of spreads one account, that kind of, as Berman documents, it sort of makes its way through a lot of Western legal thinking, in particular in the English medieval law. And then it sort of comes out in the good liberal, what I would think of as the good liberalism in the American founding, as yeah, as sort of, and then it then it becomes sort of a more general political teaching. And so I guess when you you describe the consent of the governed maybe as a useful fiction, I think, or it's a better fiction than other fictions, but. What do you make of that? I mean, is it, and then also it consent to the government, but in an American context would be Republican or representative uh, mm-hmm. consent, not, not consent of each and every person, but of those you have appointed. So, you know, necessarily that's why the Philadelphia convention wants state ratifying conventions, not, not just the state legislatures because it wants to have that, you know, approval apart just from state authorities. So uh, what, what do you make of all of that? Good question. A couple of points here. One is, as far as like the genealogy of the concept, I don't really try to trace that through here. I mean, to the extent I rely on historical work in this book, it's more on Edmund uh, Morgan's 
really good book on inventing the people, you know, and he sort of talks about the idea of the people and, and that and consent and so forth. But he's sort of starting with the English civil wars in the 17th century, I think is what he's mostly talking about. And that's kind of where I, as far back as I go here, but I'm sure the idea does go farther back. Um, Berman's book, one I've relied a lot on for other purposes, but I haven't really focused on it for this purpose. I mean, even work that, you know, I do quite a bit of work in the area of religious freedom and other people do, and, you know, trace, you might say very related ideas way back, you know, to Tertullian and so forth, you know, that, that religion has to be consensual and those things are not unrelated, I think, to this idea, you know, that authority, you know, needs to be accepted by, you know, it can't, can't just be coercively imposed and so forth. So the fundamental idea probably has a lot of roots and, it's also one that I don't in any way mean to disparage it. I mean, I think it's a very valuable one for lots of, for lots of purposes and contains real truth. But just in a couple steps, I mean, the sort of most common objection, I think, though, to this as an account of the authority of, say, modern governments like ours, is that most of us never really did have an opportunity to consent. You know, no one ever sat us down and said, you know, do you, <laughs> do you consent to be governed by this, you know, this regime? And if so, you know, initial here, we just didn't. And theorists who try to make up for that with theories of implied consent or constructive consent say some good things, and I think even relevant and valuable things, but don't really supply actual consent by most of us. So that's why I, I argue that it's sort of a fiction. But in explaining how a fiction works, I do say that a fiction will work, uh, it needs to satisfy a couple of conditions. One is plausibility. It doesn't need to be true, but it needs it to be true-ish. You know, you can't really work with a fiction, even, you know, um, a movie or a book and a, a big political fiction like this, unless it is true-ish and the the, the uh, fiction of consent of the governed, I think, is quite true-ish for our system, but its plausibility does hinge on things like voting rights and freedom of speech. And these are all, I think, very valuable things. So it's a fiction that, though it is partly fictional, has had, I think, very beneficial effects. And, you know, it's sort of an ennobling fiction, you might say, and one that works to make government, uh, I would say, better, more enlightened, and so forth than it would be coming from some other fiction, for example, you know, that the parties for the vanguard of the proletariat, for example, yeah. and, the, you know, is going to lead us to the revolution. So it's a very valuable fiction in that sense. And again, by fiction, I, I try to carefully distinguish between a fiction and a lie. I mean, those blur together at some point, but they're not the same thing, I think. And no. I'm saying that this is a fiction. I don't mean to be saying it's, you know, our system is based on lies. I think it's based on things that are partly fictional, but sort of valuable, uh, ennobling fictions insofar as we act on them. So you've used, uh, you said, truish, uh, you know, truthful uh, fiction. Is there a truthful account of legal authority and how would we know it? <laughs> yeah, well, towards the end of the book, I try to get into that because the first part of the book is, uh, the first chapters are mostly trying to expound the idea that authority can be based on a fiction, you know, what we call authority, the functions of authority can be based on a fiction, but that one of the consequences of that is that there are a lot of questions that we perpetually debate, seemingly never reach answers, and that one of the reasons for that is that we're treating what's at bottom of fiction as if it were a fact, as if there were some fact of the matter that could settle what the Constitution means, for example, with respect to some particular thing or what a statute means. To the extent that those things are based on fictions, there's not going to be any fact of the matter that can settle a lot of those debates. And so I think that helps to explain why we never do reach any sort of real answers, and we probably never will, because, you know, that's not the kind of thing that could yield those kinds of answers. But that's still dealing with sort of, we're calling it authority. We, we call it authority. I call it authority in the first part of the book, but later I suggest this might be sort of a faux authority. So if you ask, as you just did, is there any sort of true authority? Could there be? The latter chapters, the last two chapters in the epilogue, try to address that one uh, more directly, that question more directly. And uh, I might mention the evolution here. I Actually, some of this is based on an article I did about 10 years ago, which suggested that, no, there couldn't really be true authority. Even God's authority is not exactly true authority. 
But reflecting on that in the intervening period, I've sort of come to the idea that no, that's a mistake. I think our modern commitment to autonomy and equality is so, you know, so, so emphatic that mm-hmm. I think it makes it very difficult for us to recognize what true authority would be. But I could argue in the last chapter and the epilogue that, for example, in a Christian perspective, I think there's in some ways a sort of standard answer to this, although one that probably most even Christians today no longer quite think in these terms. That is, yeah, there is a true authority. <laughs> you know, the king of kings, the, you know, the, the early governments that we respect have a kind of authority but it's sort of a shadow of the true authority that, you know, is there and someday will actually be more operative. And I try to explain how that kind of authority would satisfy, could satisfy the conditions of real authority in a way that earthly governments just really can't. It's something you also write about in the book is anthropology and the significance of who we think man is. Uh, what mm-hmm. do we make of ourselves? What are we for? as getting at the, this question of legal authority. And so, as you were saying, the dominant understanding, I think, uh, particularly amongst you know, elite classes, is you know, we're autonomous. Uh, we give the law to ourselves from you know, deep within our conscience, which we conceive of in a very subjective way. And, and that's who the human person is, is sort of growing in sophistication with his own law-giving or her law-giving. And the other conception of that is, yeah, I think you use this term, which I, I like that term, is that, you know, maybe we're deeply relational and, yeah. and we're not autonomous. Uh, we're, we're dependent on others for everything. And that's sort of a recognition of wisdom there, uh, that, that we need mm-hmm. other people, not just for contracts, but in deeply embedded ways. But I guess my question to you is, and that's the position you side with, I, I largely agree with that position. What does that mean, though, for law? And for government, might that give us a way for thinking about it that moves it beyond a, a fiction, even the noble fiction you describe? Well, I guess I think that, and again, I think this is, a, a, obviously there are lots of different views on this, including lots of different Christian views. And so I'm not suggesting that even all Christians would, would, would agree with this, but I think it's actually a fairly common Christian position mm-hmm. to say that, let's say the, the governments of this world have a kind of authority. I sometimes call it full authority, but I don't mean that it's not real or that it's not valuable. You know, they have a kind of authority, but it isn't really the ultimate authority. So to that extent, human law, positive law, will never have the really kind of ultimate authority, you know, or reflect the kind of ultimate authority that, say, divine law would have. And that, I think, is actually a fairly, I don't think that's anarchic or nihilistic or anything. I think that's a, a pretty healthy understanding to remind us, you know, on the one side, you know, yeah, there is a real authority there. But on the other hand, it isn't really the ultimate authority, you know, and we need to keep that in mind. You know, I think that reminds us of the limits of law. It prevents uh, law and government from becoming sort of objects of idolatry. And, but I, you know, in this book, I'm not really trying to argue that on theological grounds at all. I'm just trying to say just that my takeoff point here is actually H.L.A. Hart's famous argument about the gunman situation, you know, where he says a gunman puts, you know, holds you up and says, you know, your money or your life, you give them your money, but you don't say that you were obligated to do so. You you might say you were obliged to do so. That was Hart's point, uh, which quickly, I think, means the gunman didn't really have authority. The gunman did give you reasons to do something, but it wasn't truly obligation that he imposed, and it wasn't really authority that the government gunman exercised. I try to argue that if you, you know, that Hart was right about that, and if you extend that logic, that would apply actually to most other contemporary accounts of what we, you know, legal theorists and others typically call authority. You know, that uh, closely examined, even if they're persuasive, even if the accounts are persuasive, they don't really yield authority. They yield reasons to comply, but not truly authority if we think hard about what authority would be. And I think that's kind of the situation we're in for most legal purposes and so on. And again, there's nothing particularly worrisome about that. And then someone might well say, you know, uh, my colleague, 
Larry Klaus or uh, Heidi Hurd would say, we should be law abiding anarchists. You know, if we're decent people, we will follow the law, but not because it truly, you know, obligates us or reflects real authority. I, I don't fully agree with that. I think it actually does give us a kind of practical authority, but again, not the ultimate authority. And again, I think that's sort of healthy to to uh, keep that in mind, to, to, you know, to recognize that, that this isn't ultimate authority. Your, your chapter on totalitarian governments and through, in particular, experience of Vaclav Havel in uh, Czechoslovakia and dealing with the Czech mm-hmm. communist government, I, I thought was instructive of, we, we could call it a fiction, uh, but you know, I think just a lie uh, about government yeah. and what government right. can do, what it should do regarding people and orders and, and commands. And I, so that might be, and I guess we, you know, just if you contrast that with consent of the government, it seems to me, if we're going to say consent of the government is a fiction, it's a fiction that I think tends to build on a truthful, dignified conception of the human person. Whereas I think of what Vaclav Havel is confronting and use the example of say the grocery store owner in, right. in Czechoslovakia who, you know, complies with the government and, you know, puts up, some sign or something like that and wants to indicate he's with the regime uh, to avoid any problems. And so that sort of society with just blind obedience and they have control over what you're doing seems to move in a direction that disregards human nature or thinks it can remake human nature. Yeah. So I do have a chapter on that. And um, honestly, I wrote that chapter mostly like five or six years ago, I think but it's become I think more uh, relevant and you know in a worrisome way in the yeah. intervening years. Well, as I and you and you touch on this in the book, but I was thinking of last summer store owners putting up Black Lives Matter signs to try and protect their property. Uh, videos I've seen of you know people putting their fists in the air to avoid uh, you know being persecuted while they're eating mm-hmm. or something by marchers and protesters. And you talk about. And I thought this was well well noted. Uh, sort of, you know, sessions people get put into at work where they have to, you know, talk about diversity or inclusivity and say things they don't really believe because mm-hmm. they don't want to lose their job. So it's yeah. it's not as foreign as we might think. Oh, not at all. As I say, I think it, unfortunately much more pertinent than it was when I wrote it, you know, five or six years ago, when I did it, I thought there are some analogies here, but I think the analogies are much stronger now than they were then. Uh, let's just say, you know, Havel, uh, so a couple points here. I distinguish between fictions and lies. And I say that our system is based on, has been based on a fiction, but that's not the same as a lie. And one of the you know, ways of distinguishing is to say, is this a proposition that People are sort of willingly entering into engaging with the fiction in the way they do when they go to a movie, for example, because it's plausible and because it yields benefits. And, you know, in the case of a movie, it might be wisdom or it might be entertainment. In the case of a political fiction, it's sort of authority, necessary coordinating authority. So as a fiction, what starts out as a fiction becomes less and less plausible and also less and less beneficial if people continue to be basically induced or compelled to recite it, it becomes harder to say that's just a fiction and it becomes more of a lie. And that's what Havel said was pervasive in Czechoslovakia that he was living in and was probably true through most of the communist countries, I think, at that point. And he thought that this was just deadening to the soul. So in that chapter, I tried to investigate whether he was right in saying that these were lies, which turns out to be a more complicated question than than it might seem to be at first, I think, but in the end, I think he was right. And also, was he right that this is as deadening into the soul as he claimed that it was? And I try to investigate that as well. You know, anthropology, again, comes into this, but, you know, if you think we are beings who have some of our dignity and our special dignity by trying to live in accordance with truth, there's a sense in which it really is deadening to the soul, I think, to live in a situation in which you're constantly being forced to recite things that you don't believe. Uh, Havel was, I think, a powerful witness of that. Solzhenitsyn was another, uh, and so forth. And I think that's becoming increasingly true in lots of aspects of our life today. I mean, a book now a year or two old, Douglas Murray's book, I've forgotten it, titled The The Madness of Crowds. Yeah, yeah, I think makes a pretty good case for that. And I just think, if you work in a university, as I do, 
that this just becomes more true every year. I don't, I don't know if the trajectory will continue. I certainly hope it won't. But Havel's sign, the one that he, you know, in his famous essay talks about is the grocer who has to put up workers of the world unite. And I've sometimes thought that academics who might get uh, forced to recite things, do certain training, affirm certain things, maybe ought to just put up a sign in their own, uh, in their own windows, and maybe I'll do this at some point if it comes to that. Workers of the world unite <laughs> just as a way of, you yeah. know, of uh, sort of invoking Havel's essay because um, I do think this becomes a pretty distressing situation that applies to us as well. So one question that comes to mind here is, so what would account then, uh, how does that good fiction begin to break down? And I guess maybe a related question is, is what do you make of uh, loyalty? Where does that come from? Loyalty. You know, I've never, re- I, every now and then I thought of, I've, Josiah Royce wrote quite a bit about loyalty and so forth. And every now and then I thought of trying to undertake some project on that, but I never got very far with it. So I think it would be related to this. Mm-hmm. I, I think one reason, for example, to cooperate in the project that may be based on what's in a certain sense of fiction is a sense of loyalty to, well, the enterprise, to those who, you know, maybe have sacrificed a great deal to, uh, you know, get the enterprise going and to start it and so forth. So, so I think they do relate, but then when you, you ask something like, you know, what's the difference between a system like ours based on what I regard as a wholesome, let's say ennobling fiction and something like the fiction in, well, the Soviet Union or Czechoslovakia and so forth. So I think there are a couple of differences. I, one you've alluded to already, but some fictions I think are going to have more beneficial effects than others. Ours, our fiction of consent of the governed is one that tends to have pretty admirable, you know, desirable implications, like it promotes voting rights, it promotes democratic participation, it promotes freedom of speech, I think, because those things all, you know, sort of follow from the fiction and make the fiction more plausible or truish, and those are good things, I think, and so forth. Whereas the other fictions won't be as, you know, nearly as wholesome or beneficial, um, like Marxist fictions, I would say, for example. But the other thing is, you know, I I don't really endorse this idea. I just sort of consider it as a possibility uh, at one point in the book that maybe fictions have a certain kind of career or life course or something, you know, that something begins as a fiction and it seems so truish and so ennobling that it just really doesn't seem like a fiction at all. Maybe saying that government must be based on the consent of the governed when Thomas Jefferson says it, you know, seems not really even a fake, more like a self-evident truth, as he said. And then perhaps, you know, over the course of time, uh, things change, whatever, and the fiction becomes less, you know, less plausible. So it, it sort of moves more into the realm of a lie, you know, more than more than a fiction. That may have been true with the sorts of fictions that Havel was talking about. You know, maybe early in the Maybe of you know communist revolution. Maybe those were such exhilarating propositions that they seem to be not just fictions, but by his point, I think it's clear they're lies. And you wonder whether a similar career might apply to some of our fictions. But I just pose that as a question. I think I'm, I'm reluctant to give even a real tentative answer to those. You know, you you talk about by the seventies it was hard for most people behind the iron curtain to believe and right. say Marxist revolutionary claims because of uh-huh. what they had observed. And I think one of the things they had observed was and, and felt was their regime did not respect them as persons and, right. and wanted to remake them in, in an image, in an uh, abstracted image, and that just hadn't worked. And, was, mm-hmm. and that sort of raises the question of truth. And I, you know, I think when, when in the case of our regime, what I think has happened as shorthand is the moral relativism somehow disestablishes truthful claims, and but also but it doesn't stay in relative land. Somehow relativism has opened itself up to sort of these claims of identity as being the valid way to think about what it means to be a human person: identity, race, sexuality, uh, gender, whatever. And that's sort of now what a lot of people are latching on to. And so something like consent to the governed doesn't really make a lot of sense because, well, that's just mm-hmm. how the dominant group stays in power or something like that. And yeah. uh, so I think it's like, it's like this two-step process of relativism then sort of turns inward and looks for another source of, you know, you can't stay a relative, relativist for very long. And it sort of has looked for something else 
and it's this is pre reason, you know, pre logic. It's an identity and some ascriptive characteristic, and that sign up becomes well. This is how we should think about government uh, mm-hmm. and and who we are and blah blah blah. Yeah, well, I agree that definitely that sort of trend is is very apparent, and it may relate to this consent of the governed proposition in the way that I hadn't exactly thought of. But to tell you the truth, I'm developing more in another book that I've been working on, pretty much finished, that has more to do with freedom of conscience. But, you know, Jefferson's proposition that we have inalienable rights and the government has to be based on the consent of the governed were based, uh, he claimed for self-evident truths, but they were linked to the idea of a creator who, you know, makes these things true and dows us with the rights and so forth. So in a certain sense, they get their normative value from premises, theistic premises, I, I would say, that I won't say that people no longer believe them. A lot of people still believe them. I believe them. <laughs> but that have become sort of publicly unavailable. You know, they're not available to, to use in public debate and so forth. And so once you get rid of the foundation of those kinds of claims, you move to something else. And I think we have moved increasingly to, in this other book that I'm working on, on conscience, I think, you know, conscience becomes less of a response to truth and God as it was for Thomas More and James Madison and uh, Thomas Jefferson, and more of just a matter of personal authenticity, yeah, right. which yeah. an authenticity then becomes itself problematic because what somebody's, you know, what gives them their, you know, a person, their, you know, their identity to which they can be authentic. And so there's a kind of a natural dissolution into various forms of trying to figure out what identity means. And so there is that. I think movement to identity, and I think you see that very, you know, very clearly in a lot of what I regard as extremely worrisome, mm-hmm. you know, modern developments and so forth. And I guess in that way, it probably does relate to it. It's not just that the proposition that we consent to the government is in itself a fiction or not entirely true. It's that the whole meaning of the proposition is embedded in, you know, sort of a view of the world that no longer is available. And that may be another way in which. Yeah. That fiction could break down and become something much less healthy. I mean, in a way, you're sort of making the argument in a different key, maybe, than that John Courtney Murray made in his 1960 book, We Hold These Truths. And, you know, that book was the natural law framework was sort of coincidental to a lot of the framers' political thought, although they maybe didn't realize it as much. And yeah. But that's what they're implicitly drawing on. And their writings about revolutionary government and separating from the British and the reasons why. And so they, they've they got this framework. They they Some of them understand it, but a lot of them don't. It's just sort of in the air. And But it's still available to us as a resource to use to develop arguments for, as Maurice says, sort of the natural law framework of our Constitution. Uh, another way of another phrase here is built better than they knew. Uh, speaking of what uh-huh. the founders did. So I, I, I'm sympathetic right. to what you're doing. One, one question that comes to mind is, is your project in thinking about authority, does it sort of presume, say, a political, liberal, political, modern principle that government is artificial? And so we have to try and find a way to account for its authority, as opposed to say, you know, another way of thinking about government is that's natural. And it's, it's a part, you know, man is a political animal. It's a part of who we are. We're born into political society. We don't create it, or it wasn't created at one point in time. And therefore, if it's natural, then maybe its authority isn't, isn't sort of an intractable problem. Right. So I guess I think that suggestion ties very much into some of what comes towards the end of the book and that you and I were discussing a little bit. A really prevalent modern assumption, you could call it Kantian or whatever, but, you know, it actually probably comes from lots of places, and that autonomy is our, you know, is our basic nature and the source of our dignity, I think does imply that there's something artificial about government. You know, I mean, government is, you got to account for it in terms of some social contract or something or other, you know, because it isn't exactly natural to us, you know, our, our, our nature is to be autonomous, meaning giving law to ourselves and so forth. The uh, idea that we're by nature political beings and that we get our, basically our essence does consist in part in relations to others, including within a hierarchy, let's say government and so forth. I, I think that is um, much closer to the relational view and makes much more sense 
in those terms. I am a little bit wary about just signing on to that, though, because, I mean, I think that could go in unhealthy direction if you just say that we're, you know, our nature is to be submissive to some sort of some sort of authority. I think you have to be sort of careful about the nature of the authority to which we should be submissive. But when I yeah. try to develop the relational account towards the end, that's the direction that is going, I think. Yeah, well, and, you know, it suggests if government is natural and it's a part of who we are, and, and as language beings, we, you know, we give reasons, but we're also radically incomplete, so we need other people, so we need law, and we need authority. We've got to develop, mm-hmm. I think, not, but also the reasons why we continue to do it and, and uphold it. And I think also it's like the anthropology of being relational would suggest that there are limits to government. It, it should uphold these, these good things of human persons like, as you suggest mm-hmm. in the book, you talk about real authority in the book, but it's not in government, it's family. Uh, we, mm-hmm. I think you say coaches, uh, friendship. Those are things that are authentic authority. So we would want the government to uphold those things because those are really accurate accounts of personhood and where we can flourish. And that would be sort of a way of thinking about good government versus bad government and what it should do. Yeah. And the other side of that is conversely, you know, what you don't want government to do is sort of attempt to basically take over, commandeer, interfere with the sources of genuine authority that still exist, you know, like yeah. family, you know, and these other sorts of associations, you know, because I do suggest that, I mean, not that they're inherently sources of good authority because those can be, yeah. they can be dysfunctional too, but they can be sources of genuine authority that help us to be constituted as full people. I think, you know, connections to families and other sorts of mentors and so forth. I, I think in the relational view are necessary to, to basically realizing our personhood. And so it would be very unfortunate if government decides to impose its norms on all of those associations and relations as well, which to which there's some tendency, I think, again, there's a pretty strong tendency in recent decades. Maybe a, a final question, sort of a big question. Does classical natural law influence you either way here in, in your argument? And when I say classical natural law, I'm meaning like th- this idea that we can sort of participate in discovering the law with others. And, you know, it's not that we don't make it, uh, but we don't, we don't really make it. It's something that we find. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so the participation meaning, well, there's just something above us or beyond us or before us that we're going to discover and use in crafting law. Does that shape your thinking about authority or should it? Or Well, I think I would say this, that I don't really try to develop anything like that in this book, but I think to the extent that the argument is persuasive, could be fit nicely into that kind of framework in a way that would sort of make sense of, you know, a lot of what we do and so forth. You know, and in the classical framework, I guess, I think, I think it would still, I mean, so if you take Aquinas, let's say, as, you know, the, you know, premier expositor of that sort of view, I think it'll still follow that governments have authority and that law would be, you know, well, a lot of it would be not directly derived from the natural law, It'd still work through tradition and positive law, determinatio, you know, as you might say, and so forth. But the government will have a kind of genuine authority. Even then, I think it's still not the ultimate authority. You know, it needs to be sort of seen as a derivative of or, you know, um, modeled on and sort of authorized by ultimate authority and so forth. And then I actually think you can kind of get to a, fairly plausible and wholesome picture of the whole condition that way. But that would be a lot more for me to take on, I think, in this book than I'm really up to. So Maybe something that I've wondered is, I assume you started writing this book, maybe I'm wrong, because you think we were experiencing a diminution of authority in our country. And and I guess mm-hmm. maybe just like your big thoughts there, too. Is that why you wrote the book? And did you find something that you didn't think was going to be there? Yes and no and yes, I guess, okay. <laughs> to those two questions. So actually, I mean, I did write some of the different sections at different times in response to more particular, you know, concerns or motivations. You know, I, I got interested some years ago in the just the sort of more jurisprudential question of authority with, you know, various, you know, legal theorists who try to explain authority and growing out of HLA Hart. And I thought that was a pretty interesting thing. And so I did some work on that. And then the middle chapters that have to do more with constitutional and statutory interpretation are things that I just, you know, I kind of work with those things and 
occasionally write things relevant to them. And I was just, those are pretty interesting in their own right. And so, you know, I already had been working on those, thinking about them, written some other things related to them. And the chapter on living with lies is something that was sort of provoked more by concerns that I have just gotten much more intense in the year since I did that thing. I never published that, I think, but I, before, but I, uh, you know, had written that some years back and, so, so that was sort of prompted by something else. So the motivation was various, I might say, for the different parts. And then it seemed to me that, uh, particularly using Hannah Arendt's sort of provocative claim, you know, actually these things kind of fit together, you know, in terms of, you know, so, some overall problem of authority in the modern world. And so I did try to connect them up in, in that way and so forth. And I, but I didn't initially think of them all as part of a single project prompted by, you know, some particular concern. But as it did come together... I just think the concern has grown much more urgent and intense. I mean, I think there are just a lot of what I see is, you know, unfortunate directions in our politics and our society, frankly, at my own university for that yeah. matter. Well, I think it's it, when we look and see those in leadership positions in, say, law, government, education, and then those who sort of give us ways of thinking about our time, like you know, media figures uh, or you know, put thoughts in people's minds, when they, they, they start to lose faith in the country or actively despise it, it, it seems mm-hmm. to me we, you know, then, then the country starts to fall apart at that point. Right. And in a way, I think this book, I hope doesn't contribute to that necessarily, but it does sort of give an account of it because, I mean, it does say that insofar as, I mean, this is just, you know, the sort of mundane analogy would be, if you go to a movie and you or your friend, whoever, who goes with you keeps saying, this didn't really happen. This is all, you know, it's going to undermine the, fi- you know, the a fiction is kind of like, I, I say at one point, kind of a conspiracy where the author and the reader or the hearer sort of agree to participate in something for their common benefit, which involves in some ways suspending judgment about certain things, you know, understanding that these are fictions, but that they're beneficial fictions. If we keep reminding ourselves, you know, these are fictions, or trashing the fictions and so forth, that will uh, sort of uh, ruin the, uh, yeah. the project. Now, now, there are reasons for it. I mean, uh, sometimes that's the appropriate thing. I mean, I think, for example, those in the communist regimes who undermined the fictions were doing something that was a good thing and so forth, even though they were undermining you know, that kind of authority. So I'm not saying this is always necessarily a bad thing, but I do think that we see a lot of that uh, going on today, you know, picking up. Mm-hmm. Uh, picking up steam and everything, and it, it, it's a concern. And uh, interestingly, it sort of ties into a rent thing about authorities, the groundwork of the world. I mean, it sort of undermines, I don't say the ultimate groundwork. I trace that, I think, in the end, suggests that that's more, you know, a transcendent ground. But, you know, in a more um, mundane sense, yeah, the groundwork of the world, I think, is really shifting in a way that is troublesome. Stephen Smith, thank you so much for joining us. We've been talking with the author of the new book, Fictions, Lies, and the Authority of Law. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is Richard Reinch. You've been listening to another episode of Liberty Law Talk, available at lawliberty.org.